So if you've ever used a laptop to render a game or edit something, you'll know that it gets really hot. Sometimes even painfully hot depending on how hard you're pushing it. You'll see most companies try to avoid this by either building laptops with tons of fans or by making the case out of metal to act as a heatsink, like in Apple's case. However, most of the time, laptops still get unreasonably hot, which causes a whole host of issues. And so in this project, we're gonna be making an extremely powerful Arduino powered laptop cooler to deal with these issues. Now, before we can start the build, we need to understand a bit more about cooling laptops. First of all, laptop CPU and GPUs generate a lot of heat when they start to perform a lot of tasks. Now, for the most part, a warm laptop is completely fine. But when it hits about 80 degrees Celsius, it starts to limit its own performance to cool it down and make sure it doesn't damage itself. This is called thermal throttling. And if you've ever watched Linus Tech Tips, you've probably heard this a lot before. Thermal throttling. Thermal throttles. Thermal throttle. Thermal throttle. Thermal throttling. A little bit of thermal throttle. Thermal throttling. Thermal throttling. It's a pretty big and annoying issue. Now this is actually kind of sad because there are plenty of examples of laptops that have the processing power to perform tasks, play games, or render something really well, but end up failing due to thermal throttling. This can all be avoided by just cooling the laptop properly. Now instead of building one like me, you could just buy an off-the-shelf cooling pad, but the majority of these don't cool enough as they have a pretty small fan that run off 5 volts supplied by your computer, which means they don't spin very fast and don't output a lot of air. Now, low airflow could be a good thing, as blowing air into a fan causes it to move. And after all, all fans are just DC motors, meaning this movement creates electrical energy as shown in this example. The last thing we want is our cooling pad to mess with our internal fans and possibly even damage our computer if there's no safety circuit inside of it. So we're gonna wanna find a spot on the bottom of the computer that gets very hot but isn't a fan vent. I found on my laptop, it got very hot here for the GPU and here for the CPU. So this is where I wanna place my fans. Now, something to note is finding out where the cooling pipes are inside your laptop is actually really important, as this is where the majority of the heat will be inside your laptop. It's as easy as feeling the bottom of it while it's rendering something, or just googling the part number followed by disassembly. Once you've found out where your cooling pipes are, you can plan your build around this to make sure your fans are always underneath them and always cooling them. So let's get started with the build. We need two 12 volt fans. Mine came from some very outdated servers, but you could easily find them in old computers, power supplies, and pretty much any other piece of electronics that gets hot. You could also easily get them online for quite cheap. So when we're looking for our fans, we want to make sure it has a built-in speed controller, or we're going to have to add a motor controller to our shopping list, which complicates things and takes up unnecessary space. You'll know it's a speed controlled fan if it has more than two cables. If it has three cables, the third cable is used to control the speed. And if it has four, like this one, the fourth cable is used to send back data to the computer to tell it how fast the fan is spinning currently. We're only going to be needing a fan with three cables, so if your fan has a fourth one, you can just cut it off. Now, we could just take the fans and plug them into a 12 volt power supply and put them underneath the laptop, and they would work great as a cooler. However, this is a bit boring, and it gives us zero control over the fan speed. So, to fix this, we're going to be adding an Arduino. This will allow us to control the fan speed and add any future improvements we want, which I'll talk more about at the end of the video. So this means that the final parts list is two 12 volt fans, one Arduino Pro Mini because it's super cheap, one switch, four buttons, and a 12 volt power supply. We're also gonna need a way to upload code to the Pro Mini. Luckily, an Arduino Uno can be used for this, which we'll talk more about in just a minute. Okay, so now we can get started with the wiring. We're gonna start by wiring the Arduino to the fan. We do this by connecting pin three on the Arduino to the speed control wire on the fan, as this pin will be sending on analog values to tell the fan's internal circuit what speed to spin at. Now, if you don't know which one of your fan's wires is the speed control wire, it's really as easy as Googling the part number. Now, we're also gonna want some way to import data into the Arduino to tell it to tell the fans how fast to spin. I started off wanting to use a potentiometer, but then decided four buttons representing 25, 50, 75, and 100% speed would be the easiest method. We're gonna connect the four buttons as follows. Okay, so first we need to solder one leg of all the buttons together to create a common ground. This can then be soldered to the ground pin of the Arduino. Then the other leg of each button will be soldered to pin four, five, six, and seven individually. Once all the soldering is done, we can upload the code and give it a test. Now, uploading code to the Pro Mini is actually kind of a mission because it has no USB ports of any kind. This is because it needs a USB programmer to upload code to it. Luckily for us, the Arduino Uno can actually act as one of these. So to do this, we're going to need to remove the 18 mega 328 chip from the Uno, 
Then the VCC and ground pin on the Pro Mini get connected to the 5V and ground pin on the Uno. Then RX connects to RX and TX connects to TX. And then finally we need to connect the GRN on the Pro Mini to the reset pin on the Uno. Now uploading the code is actually pretty simple. All we need to do is copy and paste the code into the Arduino IDE, select Pro Mini under boards, then click upload. Now speaking of code, let's just take a second to look at what our code is doing. Now because I made two different versions of this, there are two different versions of code. The first one uses a screen and the second one doesn't. So for now we're just going to take a look at the second version. Okay, so in void setup we say that pin 4, 5, 6 and 7 will all be inputs, as these will be used for the button pins. Then in the loop we say if the value of any of these pins goes low, i.e. the button is pushed, to send an analog value to the fan, which tells the fan how fast we want it to spin. Now 255 is the full fan speed and 64 is 25% fan speed. Now that's pretty much the whole bulk of the code, as it just consists of a bunch of if statements. And that's pretty much the same for the screen version as well, except we mix a few screen controls in between the if statements. Now that our code's uploaded, we can plug our fans and Arduino into a 12 volt power supply and give it a test. The positive terminal on the 12 volt power supply connects to the raw pin on the Pro Mini, and then ground goes to ground. Now once all that's done and we've confirmed everything working, we can start building our case. Okay, I just want to take a quick break from the video to prove my point about thermal throttling. I've got this little mini Intel Atom PC with no internal cooling whatsoever, and we're going to download and run Just Cause 2 on it. The first time with no fan whatsoever, and the second time with a large server fan underneath it. Then we're going to record the frame rate and see how the two compare. Now of course using the data from a benchmarking tool would be way more accurate, I just wanted to use the game as a quick way to prove my point. Now I made two cases for this project and I'm by no means a perfectionist, which just shows you how badly the first case must have turned out. The biggest issue was the airflow out of it was still pretty bad despite the huge fans. This design error was then fixed in the second version, so for now we're going to take a look at how to build that one. Okay, so we're going to start with some sturdy cardboard and cut out two A4 size pieces, which will act as our base and our top. We will then need to cut out holes for the fan's airflow. It's really crucial that you make sure you cut really large holes in the base, as if these holes are too small they could limit the airflow coming out the top. Then we're going to need to cut a 7cm rectangle to connect the two pieces in the back, and cutting air vents in this piece is also a good idea. Now that we've cut all the holes for the fans, we can put our protective mesh over these air holes. Now mine is just a plastic mesh that you can find at pretty much any hardware shop. Cut out a larger piece and glue it over the back of each hole. I would recommend not using super glue for this, as it doesn't seem to want to keep the two pieces together. Hot glue does work well though. Okay, so now that we've got all the air vents covered, we can cut out the rest of the case supports, which is just two side pieces and a front rectangle. Now, however tall you make this front piece decides at what angle your laptop will sit at. If you make it 7cm like the back piece, it'll sit flat. Or if you make it 3cm like mine, it'll have the same angle as mine. Once you've done that, you can put your fans inside and make sure they all roughly fit. Now, the last piece of the case to make is the button assembly, which is very dependent on the size of your laptop. I have a slightly larger laptop, so when I put my laptop on top of my cooler, I can no longer access my buttons. So I made mine extendable with some magnets and longer wires. But this all depends on the size of your laptop. Now, the way to build the box is just making a rectangular hole in the front of the case and then making a rectangular box that fits into that. Mount your buttons and power switch in the box with a magnet and stick a magnet in the case. Obviously make sure you leave enough slack in the case to ensure the box can come out far enough. Now I have to say, for this part the magnets are really necessary, as if you don't use them, the wires will just push against the box and keep it from staying in place. Now I didn't mention the power switch before, but installing it's pretty easy, here's the final wiring diagram. Okay, so now that our pieces are cut out, we can start putting them together. We start this by gluing our base pieces together using some super glue. Once these base pieces are on, we need to hold off on putting the top piece on, because this is the point where we're going to mount our fans. Now, if you take a look at the first version, you'll see that the fans are all mounted on the base. This is why the airflow is so bad, because there's this big gap between the fans and the laptop, where all the air can disperse. So knowing this, on the second version, we're going to want to mount the fans flush with the top piece, to maximize airflow onto the laptop. Okay, so to mount the fans onto this top piece, a liberal amount of hot glue needs to be put around the fan edges, which should hold it in place just fine. Then a tiny Arduino can be mounted in the front of the case with some hot glue and all the final wiring can be done as per the wiring diagram. Once that's done we can glue the top case on and give it a final test. Plug in the 12 volt power supply and try out the four different speeds. If everything checks out we can place our laptop on top and see how it cools. 
Now, to see the results, I recommend a program called RealTemp. Once it's installed, start doing something that's CPU intensive and see if your CPU hits its max temperature. If it doesn't, the cooling pad's doing its job. Now, it's worth mentioning that there are a lot of different factors that play a role in thermal throttling, and a cooling pad won't always fix the problem, so it's definitely worth experimenting with different fixes such as cleaning the laptop. However, using a cooling pad is never a bad idea. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to find links to the parts used or more detailed instructions, click the link in the video description. If you like the video, give it a like or subscribe for more.